حمد كثيرا وطيبا مباركا فيه صلوات الله وسلامه على نبينا الكريم وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين وعلى من تمسك بسنته باحسان الى يوم الدين ثم اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار. What there is no doubt about is that the Quran pays a lot of attention and gives a lot of concern to the younger people of the community. And we find that indicated and shown in the many verses of the Quran, in the many chapters of the Quran in which young people have been highlighted. They are the source behind the story. Like the trials and tribulations that Yusuf, the Nabi of Allah, had to go through, Salawatu Allahi wa Salamu Alayhi. Also the story of Ismail, who was taken in the Quran and the Sunnah by his father Ibrahim. And he was put there in Mecca and his father saw in a dream that he was going to slaughter his son and his son was patient. That story is a story that's highlighting the youngsters in the Quran, the Ashab al -Kaf. We read Surah al -Kaf, or we try to read it every Friday. For the rest of our lives, inshallah, we should try to make an effort to read Surah al -Kaf because of the benefits in it. it. Talks about the story of the young people were being persecuted because of their religion and they were in a hostile environment because of their religion but they were mature enough, responsible enough to make hijra and they went to the calf and they sought refuge and solace and protection by Allah's permission in the calf. So those are examples and there are many examples in the Quran other than that. Luqman giving advice to his son in Surah Luqman. All of those are examples of Allah is just showing our community if the Quran is the kalam of Allah, the speech of Allah is the best speech and the Quran contains the best stories, then those people who believe in the Quran should take heed and pay attention. The Quran put emphasis on young people. So if our community is not doing the same, then we're neglecting something that Allah is with Jalla put a lot of emphasis on. And anyone who neglects what Allah is with Jalla is trying to indicate to them or explain to them, then there are going to be problems. As for the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi then Hadith Wala Haraj, there are just so many examples of how he intentionally took the time out to pay tribute and also to give concern and to pay attention to the shabab of his community. Again, showing the people this is his sunnah. If we as a community were to neglect intentionally a sunnah of the Prophet that is an integral part of society, there are going to be problems. If a person neglects the sunnahs that are, that are connected to the prayers, those prayers, if he were to pray them, the benefit will come to him. So if he neglects them, the harm will only come to him for the most part. But the sunnah of paying attention to the youth, if the community were to neglect that, or the individual were to neglect that, and not only is it going to harm and hurt the one who's neglecting, but it's also going to bring some harm, some pain, some problems to the community. So we look at him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he surrounded himself with youngsters with the same enthusiasm and the same concern as he surrounded himself with older, responsible people to carry this religion. From them, Addis ibn Malik. When 
I mentioned that name and these other names, Anas Ibn Malik, you Muslims who are young out there, and those of you who are older, what's wrong with our Islam that certain individuals can be asked or mentioned? We don't have an idea who is that. Some of these people who come, like yesterday I was all the way up in the north where I gave the khutbah about five hours away from here. I was shocked to see in that area that Romanians moved into the area. I'm not against Romanians and I won't stereotype Romanians. But they don't have a good image, reputation in this country. This country doesn't even want to let them in. And I'm sure that there are some good Romanians who are not even Muslims. I'm sure. Because all people are not the same. So you can't say all Romanians are bad or good. All Romanians, they beg. You can't say that. Because there's some good Romanians. But anyway, I saw some Romanian ladies who had moved into the community where I gave the khutbah. We came out of the masjid. When I came out, they were in front of the masjid begging. And they had hijab on. Now if people of the community didn't know them, and you just saw one of those ladies, you may be inclined to give her sadaqah. But everyone knew. This is a Romanian lady who's just begging. So I didn't want to treat the lady bad because if someone is begging, Muslim or not Muslim, you should never speak to them in a nasty way. You either give to them or you don't give to them in a nice way. You give to them or you don't give to them in a nice way. Anyway, there's a surah in the Quran called Al-Mumtahina. Al-Mumtahina, which means to test and examine. So if someone wants to come, He's a brand new Muslim. He's a revert Muslim. Brand new. He wants to marry my daughter. He wants to marry your daughter. We're not going to hand our daughters over just like that. Just because a brand new Muslim wants to marry him, her. We're going to look at all of the issues on the table. And we're going to make sure, is he marrying her? Is he becoming a Muslim just to marry her? So we have to test him. That's what that surah is about. That when the women used to come to the Prophet, people used to come to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa some of them he would test them in order to see were they really sincere. So that's the point I want to make. When the lady was asking me for money, I wanted to test her. Because she was saying to me, Fisa bi lillahi, brother. Fisa bi lillahi, inshallah, brother. But I wanted to test, were those just words that she learned in order to get our money? I said to her, okay lady, I'm going to give you some money. I'm going to give you five pounds, but you have to answer these simple questions. Name for me two wives of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She didn't know two wives of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She didn't know Khadija. She didn't know Aisha. She didn't know some of the names that you little sisters had out there. She didn't know any name. I said, okay, it's possible. It's possible. No problem. I said, okay, okay, okay. What are the five pillars of Islam? She didn't know the five pillars of Islam. She didn't know the five pillars of Islam. I said, name an important angel in Al-Islam. She didn't want any more questions. She was done. She walked away. She got in the wind and she walked away. So what's the point here? I can't blame her for not knowing. I blame her for lying and trying to portray that she's a Muslim to get money and she's lying hustling people. I blame her for that. But I don't blame her for not knowing the information because she's not a Muslim. As for the Muslim community, when some of these names are mentioned, these are people we should know. Especially you young people. Because although everybody here, we know Abu Bakr, we know Umar, we know Uthman, and they are examples for us and inspirations for us. But still, because you people are young, you have to come to know and you have to get to know the stories of those young companions that the Prophet paid attention to, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah be pleased with all of them. Like I mentioned, Anas ibn Malik. Anas. He took care of the Prophet from the age of 10 until the Prophet died 10 years later. So he was 20 years old when the Prophet died, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But because he took care of him at the age of 10, 11, 12, 13, this boy, he knew everything about the private and the personal sunnah. Whatever the sunnah is that the prophet did in his house, 
away from the eyes of the people. This boy knew. And how did he put himself in that position? His mother took him and said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm going to give you my boy so that he can learn this religion. So he took care of the Prophet. And the Prophet paid attention to that boy, Sunnah. Also, Al Nu'man ibn Bashir, who was a young boy, his mother came and said, Ya Rasulullah, or his father came and said, I'm going to give my boy, Nu'man ibn Bashir, a big gift. And I want you to be a witness because his mother told me to cause you to be a witness to what I'm giving him. Prophet Muhammad said, Did you give your other children a gift like that as well? The man said, No. Prophet Muhammad said, Then I'm not going to be a witness on that oppression. Be just between all of your children. So that young boy, he's a Nu'man ibn Bashir, who also has a lot of story that we could tell you. This the point is, they are many, many. Young boy, his name is Amr ibn Salama. Six years old. He learned the Quran, a lot of the Quran, more than the elders. And as a result of that, he led the people in the prayer. And because of his position of memorizing the Quran and being the Imam of the people at the age of six, Prophet Muhammad and the other companions, they raised his status. They praised him in front of the people. They made him feel good about his accomplishment and about what he succeeded at doing by Allah's permission. So there are many companions from the men and from the women. From the women, obviously, from the wisdom that Prophet Muhammad married our mother, Aisha, and I call her our mother because Allah said that in the Quran. The Nabi is closer to the believers in their own selves, and all of his wives are their mothers. So just as some of you have your mothers back there, and some of our mothers are not here, some of our mothers have even died, may Allah have rahmah upon them, just as you have love, honor, respect, and reverence for your mother, the wives of the Prophet, you have to look at them the same way. And if you're a person who someone says to you, Ya Abdullah, Ya Amatullah, your mother who gave birth to you, what's her name? And you say, I don't know. I don't know my mother's name. My biological mother, who may be sitting back there, she may be home right now. Someone come and say, Suleyman, what's your mother's name? He says, I don't know. Anybody who answers, I don't know, when the question is, what's your mother's name? He says, I don't know. We're going to say, maybe when he was born, they dropped him on his head. In the hospital, he fell out of their arms and he fell on his head. So he doesn't know his mother's name. Something terrible has happened to this person who doesn't know his mother's name. But everybody knows their mother's name. He gave birth to him. Put your hand up if you know your mother's name. Put your hand up if you know her name. Put your hand up. Alright, put your hands down. If you don't know your mother's name, put your left hand up. Put your left hand up if you don't know your mother's name. Alhamdulillah. We don't have them in our group, in our club. Okay. Prophet Muhammad's wives are our mothers. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Radiallahu anhunna. And wallahi, billahi, tallahi. They're better than our mothers who gave birth to us. Prophet Muhammad's wives are better than our mothers who gave birth to us. So if a person is going to love his mother who gave him life by Allah's permission, he has to love his mothers, may Allah be pleased with them, who gave him spiritual life because Allah told them to teach the people the religion and what they learned from the house of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So the point here is, guys, we have to come to know these individuals. You young people, you have to read about the story of those youngsters who were born as children in Mecca, who were born as children in Al Medina, and who grew up very young under the tutelage and under the supervision of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they are Allah, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Prophet Muhammad said, let's imagine this, let's imagine this. The king, the prime minister, the president, some important person who's running a country. He's responsible for a big community, like Prophet Muhammad was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You don't have access to him. I don't have access to him. Our local MP, if we wanted to get access to him, we have to go through 
a long song and a long dance. We have to jump through the burning hula hoop just to get an appointment with him. From how it wasn't like that. He said in authentic hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came to his, his companions, you people want to know who the hellfire is haram on? Haram like khamar. Haram like gambling. Haram like being bad to your parents. Hellfire is haram on this person. They say, who, who, Ya Rasulullah? He said, Kullu hayyin layyin sahum qareeb min al -das. Every individual was easy on himself, easy with other people, and he's sahl, like the name Suhail or Suhaila. He's easy with dealing with people, easy. There's that individual who, when you tell him to be quiet, he won't be quiet. There's that individual when you deal with them, they're difficult. They expect you to read their minds. They make you responsible for things. How can you know what he's even thinking? Complicated. Prophet Muhammad didn't like that kind of individual. He didn't like for us to make things unnecessarily complicated. Even in the way we talk. Rasulullah said that the individual who goes overboard in trying to speak extremely intelligently. He said his example is like the cow. You know the cow is... His lip, his tongue is all over the place when he eats all over the place. Rasulullah said the one who makes an effort to talk overboard, he's like that cow. Because he wants the people talk in your normal way. Talk on the level that people understand. Talk in the way people are used to. Point is, don't be complicated. Don't be difficult. If you are an easy going person, hellfire is haram for you. And then the last characteristic, and this is the point. This is the point I want to make. The hellfire is haram, and the one who is qareebun min al-nas, he's close to the people. He's easily accessible to the people. He's not sitting way up there on a high horse, very difficult to get to. Prophet Muhammad wasn't like that. The young man will come to him and say, Ya Rasulullah, I need this, I need that. The slave lady, the slave lady will come to him, he will look at her, give her his ear, Ya Rasulullah, I need this, I need that. He was in the in the easy grasp of the community. So guys, my point is, learn about these individuals. Fatima, Prophet Muhammad married Prophet Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. May Allah be pleased with her. She was one of those individuals that he paid a lot of attention to and given her a lot of instructions about how to be a woman, how to be a wife. How to be a mu'min and so forth and so forth. So, with that being the case, the community has to do the same thing. And this thing that you brothers and sisters did here today, this is from the sunnah. And this is something that we should be doing. This is from the sunnah. Abdullah ibn Umar, when he memorized Surah Al-Baqarah, they slaughtered a camel for him and had a party. Celebrating that he memorized Surah Al-Baqarah, the biggest, longest surah of the Qur'an, the surah that has the greatest ayat of the Qur'an. And Imam al nawawi and we do the 40 hadith of Imam al nawawi but as you know, he has other books, a lot of other books. One of the books he wrote was called Adab, Hamlet al-Qur'an, the characteristics of those who memorize the Qur'an. And he talked in a chapter in that book about which companions memorize the Quran and what they were famous for. And he mentioned about Abdullah ibn Abbasin when he memorized Surah Al Baqarah after a number of years that he slaughtered for him a camel. So, therefore, if our child were to memorize Juzamma, if our child was to memorize Yasin Ar Rahman, if our child were to memorize some dua, this or that, and they accomplished something like that, it's from the Sunnah that we acknowledge that. Because if you don't acknowledge what a person has accomplished, especially young people, the risk is ran where they wouldn't want to try to please you, try to be people who are going to accomplish things. And that is what we get from the good teachers of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we want to say, and I say on behalf again of the masjid and the community and the administration, may Allah Ta'ala accept it from you teachers for your 
endeavors and for your commitment and for your sacrifices because teaching in the public school is a thankless job. Teaching in the public school is a thankless job. You don't get any thanks from anyone, but at least you get money, at least you get money. But is the money worth the behavior of the kids? That's up to the person to decide. What about in a weekend school in the Muslim community? It's a thankless job. But your thanks are with Allah, inshallah, shakar Allah lakum. So in keeping with that hadith of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whoever didn't thank the people who didn't thank Allah, I want to take this time out. On behalf of the community, on behalf of the administration, for you teachers, you brothers, you sisters, shakar Allah lakum. You don't know, Ahi, you don't know, sister, that sitting with these kids with the right knee, I'm coming here to try to educate these kids little by little about what I know about this religion, that thing may get you into the, into the Jannah. Don't look at that as being something small and insignificant. The niya can make that thing really big. My goal, my objective was just to impart knowledge to these kids not a lot but a little day by day week by week and you get a reward inshallah for that so may Allah Azza put it in your mawazin of hasanat and you parents who are here or present continue inshallah as we jump to our um, uh, be committed I just wanted to say one more thing before I give my talk and that is there was this little girl here her name was Juwaydiya I remember Juwaydiyah because I remember the prophet's wife, her name is Juwaydiyah. She got about three or four certificates. Every time she came up, she took it with her right hand and she looked at me and she said, Thank you. Each and every time, four times. Some of you said, Thank you. Some of you said, Jazakallah khair. But she's the only one who said it. Each and every time, and she took it with her right hand. Some of you said thank you the first time, you forgot it the second and the third time. Some of you said Jazakallah Khair the first time, but you took it with your left hand. It was all mixed and matched like that. But that little girl, Juwaydiyah, she was on the ball. So may Allah with you give special, 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 special barakah to that little girl, Juwaydiyah. I was impressed with her edit. Looks like the girl in the mustaqbal, inshallah, is going to be a girl that in edit. What akhlaq, inshallah. But may Allah give barakah to you guys as well. Take with your right hands, give with your right hands, eat with your right hand, drink with your right hand. Only use that left hand if it's absolutely necessary. Absolutely. This brother just brought in this um, microwave. So he's carrying the microwave and he has the key in his left hand. So someone wants to get the key to go to the car. He can give him the key from his left hand now because we don't expect him to to, to change the hand with the key in the microwave. It's easy now. He, he's forced, so he just gives the left hand. But never, ever, ever use that left hand for anything other than doing the qadha al hajjah akramakum Allah. Ta'ar Allah yamakum. You go to the toilet, that's what the left hand is for. Or for any dirty thing, you want to clean your nose or something like that. So the brothers asked me to talk today something about manhood in Al-Islam and womanhood in Al-Islam as well. And it's a big issue because manhood and womanhood is the sunnah of Allah. Whether you're a Muslim or not Muslim, white or black, Arab, non-Arab, rich or poor, you can read, you can't read. Whatever the case is, this is the sunnah that everyone has to pass through. Mankind is going to experience, even if an individual himself may not pass through it because he may die, because he may have some intellectual uh, problems. Nonetheless, as a race of human beings, boys become men and girls, they become women. Sunnatullahi fil ladina khalu min qabl wa la intajidu li sunnati nahi tabdila. It's always going to be something. So, since it's something that is part of the human experience, the Quran and the Sunnah is clearly going to mention it. So, if I would ask one of you guys, okay, if we were going to say something like, what did Al Islam say about manliness, manhood, 
woman, being a woman, where do we begin to think? What ayah, what hadith, what touches that? Well, we can deal with this a few ways. The way I want to deal with it today is, inshallah, Allah has described in the Quran in a number of ayah. He has described the characteristics of the individual who Allah sees him as being a man. They call in Arabic, Ar-Rajula. Ar-Rajula. And there are many characteristics, meaning. And if an individual is not doing these things, he can be 40, 45, 35, but he's not a man. In terms of his species, he's a man, but in terms of qualifying what it is to be a man in this religion, he's not a man. And they're mean. Like for an example, what Allah mentioned in Surah at Toba. He said in the Quran that Masjidun Usisa ala taqwa min awwali yawmin ahakwan taquma fi. فيه رجال يحبون أن يتطهروا والله يحب المطهرين. Allah described the masjid to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم which is better than masjid al dirar of the munafiqeen. Allah said, verily, there is a masjid that it is more appropriate for you to stand in that masjid and pray in that masjid in Muhammad. In that masjid are a group of men, men who love to purify themselves. And Allah loves those who are pure. Allah loves those who are purified. This ayah, Allah used that word, in that masjid are men. So what's the characteristics? A number of them. And that is that they attend the masjid. The Muslim man who doesn't go to the masjid at some point during the week we don't expect him to go to the masjid every day, all day, because he has to work. Another quality of a man, as you're going to see, inshallah, that he has to work. Can't sit and be lazy and not do anything. But we'll come to that, inshallah. But this ayah shows that the man in Islam is the individual who he has to have some connection to the masjid at some point. Praying the Juma prayer, he has to. Some connection. If he's one of those people who he's not connected to the masjid on a weekly basis in some shape, form, or fashion, then something is going on that is wrong. There's a problem. And that individual needs to look at himself and needs to address himself. So that these men, they purify themselves and they love to be pure. The meaning of that verse is they go to the masjid in wudu. That's the meaning of the, 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 the ayah. That when they go to the masjid, and they purify themselves. That's the meaning. But there's a broader meaning. And the broader meaning is that men, they have that responsibility of taking care of themselves. So you brothers who are fathers to some of these boys and mentors to some of these boys, sometimes the hygiene of the boy is not on the level of the hygiene of the girl. Sometimes that's just natural. That's how it is. The hygiene of the boy is not like the hygiene of the girl. But this ayat describes the men in Islam as people who are purified. They love to be purified. So the Muslim man has to take care of cleanliness. His own personal hygiene. He is not a man. He's still a boy. He's still a kid. If he's an individual... He doesn't know how to clean himself. He doesn't know how to wash himself. He doesn't know how to brush his teeth. He doesn't know how to groom himself. He doesn't know how to keep up with smelling in a way that is acceptable. We don't say it has to be on the level of the girl. Because if the man has been described as taking care of hygiene and cleanliness, then the girl even more. Then the girl even more. Unfortunately, I do remember when I was growing up, we used to have P, physical education. We used to have to get dressed downstairs in front of each other in the lockers. And the girls over there would go upstairs and we'd play whatever sport we had to play that day. I remember growing up, being around some girls growing up to this day, I still remember they had terrible hygiene. Terrible hygiene. 
So our religion, as the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Tuhur Iman. Cleanliness is half of this religion. Being clean. Half of the religion. So we find in Al-Islam that a person is going to make wudu at least five times a day. The Prophet used to praise and used to encourage the kids, to encourage the community. Use that stick to brush your teeth. And during his time, that's all he had was a stick. We're not going to tell you just stick to the stick right now in 2016. We're going to tell you brush your teeth with some toothpaste. And then use the stick. But if all you have is the stick, then inshallah, hey, hey, there's barak in that stick. But I wouldn't advise that you just stick to that. So the point here is, in the religion of Islam, our boys, you guys, hygiene is critical. Your personal hygiene and your living space. The message is hygiene. When we go to this toilet in here, Akramakumullah, there's a way to use a toilet, a way not to use the toilet. So the Muslim is always not only thinking about me, myself, and I. He's going to think about the angels. He's going to think about the jinn. He's going to think about another brother, a sister is going to come in and use this after me. So I have to use the toilet the right way. And I can't use the toilet in a way that I'm being disgraceful or I'm being insensitive to all of those other Creations from Allah created you like the Malaika, like the jinn, and like our brothers and sisters. So that's the first point. For our boys and our girls. Some of you guys, really, I think what is natural is as the kid grows, he wants to be looked at as being responsible. He wants to be looked at as not being a kid. But sometimes when the parent looks at the level of hygienic understanding of the kid, of the boy, especially. You can see, he's still real immature in his mind. In al Islam, you have to take care of this issue of being clean, this issue of surrounding yourself in an environment that is clean and your, your sisters as well. Second issue, and there are many, many issues, is what Allah mentioned concerning the men, but women get a benefit out of it as well. He said in the Quran, Rijalu qawamuna ala nisa'i بما فضل الله به بعض ما رضاه وبما أنفق من أمواله. He said that the men, he said the men, men, they are responsible for their. The men have been given a degree of superiority or a level over the women. التفضيل. The men in Al Islam have been given a degree above the women because Allah has chosen them over them. This doesn't mean that the lady is down. This doesn't mean that the lady is no good. I remember when I gave the khutbah to the Eid to this community and we went down to talk to the ladies as that was the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I remember I shared with those sisters the hadith where the Prophet on the day of the Eid he went down to the women and he said to the women Hey you women, ya ma'ashir al-nisa to sadaqna you should give sadaqah. Because I see that you women are going to be the majority of the people in the hellfire. That hadith is in Bukhari Muslim. I remember I was given that hadith to encourage the ladies to give the same way the Prophet did. And I remember when I was talking, there was some lady who was upset with that, making faces and things like that. I don't think she was from Bedford. Maybe she came from a community outside of Bedford to pray the aid with us. But I could see she wasn't happy with that statement. As if the Prophet was putting women down. He wasn't putting women down with that. First of all, women are the majority of the people on the earth. So they're going to be the majority of the people in the hellfire. They're the majority of the people in terms of population. And doing Yom Al-Qiyamah, there'll be 50 women to one man, as the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was mentioning that to the women so that they would just get themselves together. Not for them to look at those words and to have a problem with what the Prophet said based upon ignorance. But anyway, the point here is, Allah Ta'ala, He mentioned in this ayat that the men have been given a level of superiority, a level over the women. Why? Because they spend on them out of what Allah has given them. That's a very important ayat. When we talk about manliness in Al-Islam, you brothers who are growing up, you have to understand the sunnah 
of Allah in the earth, not just in Islam, but on the earth as it relates to human beings, is that the man is the one who should be taking care of his family. He doesn't have to necessarily be the richest guy in the world. He doesn't necessarily have to have the best job in the world. But with what he has, with whatever he does, he goes out, and whatever that job is, he goes out with the goal and the objective of being a parent, a father, a husband who is productive, who's going to give what he has, because this ayah said that the real men are those people who take care of their women. They take care of their family. If, in fact, the lady was in a position where she was taking care of her family and she was doing that because she wanted to do that, then no problem. Prophet Muhammad's wife, our mother, Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her, she used to employ Rasulullah, she used to pay him wages, she used to give him gifts left, right, and center. So there's nothing wrong with that. But there is something wrong with the equation where the Muslim man, he relies upon the Muslim woman. Then that's a problem. So you brothers should know that it is important. If you go to school, you study, you get a degree, inshallah, and you get qualifications, your ability to get a good job and to take care of your family and to be a, fam a community member who can help out more, your eyes are increased. But if you goof off in school, and you waste time in school, you'll be like a lot of the people who are older who are walking around, you see them every day on the high road all around this area, people who didn't take advantage of getting an education as a result of that. They don't have a job, or they have low menial, low paying jobs that they're not happy with. So right now is the time and this is how you should look at it, you young brother, you should look at it. This is an opportunity for you to build those building blocks for your future, inshallah, to not only be able to help take care of your family and your own responsibilities, but just to have a life, inshallah, that's not going to be as difficult as the life of the one who doesn't have any money because he didn't get an education. But again, I told you before, education is not always the main thing that will make a person happy or unhappy. But... If you're struggling financially, that's going to cause problems that you're going to have to deal with. That is life. So we're always encouraging the young brothers of our community, make sure you don't goof off at school. Take that school and your education seriously. As for you sisters in this particular point, men are the maintainers and the providers for women. You should understand as well that Al-Islam doesn't say anything against the woman giving you the education. As long as she doesn't compromise her religion, she doesn't compromise her principles and so forth and so on. Last thing that we want to mention, Khwani, in these uh, 45 minutes that have gone past very, very quickly, and there are many, 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 many examples that, that Allah and His Messenger mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, is what He mentioned, min al mu'minin. مَنْ صَدَقُوا مَا أَحَدُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ فَمِنْهُ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبُهُ وَمِنْهُ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرْ وَمَا بَدْرُوا تَبْدِيلًا من المؤمنين رجال From the believers are men who have taken care of the contract that they made with Allah From them some of them have done it completely and they made the ultimate sacrifice and from them, some are still waiting for their opportunity. This ayah is actually describing the Prophet's companions, may Allah be pleased with all of them and peace and blessings of Allah be upon them. That they were believers and they were men who did what? They took care of their contract. This ayah is talking and describing how men, they work by their principles, men, they stay established, focused on the job at hand. Men, they have their own idea and they're not easily influenced by every Amr Bakr and Zayn who comes with a new idea. I think you guys are aware that yesterday, one of the greatest personalities in Al Islam, in latter times, he died. You know what I'm talking about? 
Muhammad Ali, the boxer. First of all, let me make this clear. Boxing, I'm not praising boxing. Boxing is haram in Islam. The way they do it. Punching someone in the face, not permissible. Showing your aura, not permissible. Boxing and people are gambling, not permissible. Boxing, they have that um, idaat, um, advertisement for beer and all of that, not permissible. Naked lady walk around in the ring, round one, round two, now round three. At the boxing match, there's ikhtilaq, men and women. Everything about boxing is haram, haram, haram. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the personality, Hamid Ali. I remember when Nelson Mandela died, I gave a talk in this masjid, and we said some things about Nelson Mandela. And I mentioned very briefly Muhammad Ali. And I said that you young kids, you millennium kids, you guys out there who are under the age of 20, I don't think you guys really know Muhammad Ali. I think you heard about him, but you don't really know about Muhammad Ali. I firmly believe as Muslims, the only heroes that we should look at, the only people we should big up, are the prophets, Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim, and the companions, Radhi Allah alayhim. We should big them up. Because every other human being, no matter how good he did, no matter how much you like him, no matter how much good you think he is, there's something you don't know, or you may know. I don't care. You think of anybody who you have respect for in the dunya. Anybody. There's something about his life or her life. Skeletons in the closet. Sometimes the people know about it. Sometimes they don't. Everybody is like that. Prophets, they're not like that. So we can always pick them up. The companions, they're not like that. Because Allah gave them the tazkiyah. Tazkiyah in the Quran. Radhi Allah wa radhu Ali. Things came out about his personal life. We're not talking about that. May Allah have mercy upon us and him. Point is, I consider Muhammad Ali to be a man. A man. And one of the reasons why I consider him to be a man is this ayat that we just read. Allah said, from the believers, there are men who they take care of the contract and the agreement that they make with Allah. So as Muslims, we all have a contract. We all have an agreement. That contract is, I have to do my best to remain a Muslim. I have to do my best to protect Islam. I have to do my best to give da'wah to Islam. I'm not complete. I'm not mistakeless. But I have to do my best. I have to have principles that I have to live by. Principles. And I can't let people push me off of the square. Not for my job, not for my money. Not because I want people to like me. No, I got to stay on the point. So anyway, this man, Muhammad Ali, was making a lot of money at a time when boxers didn't make that kind of money. He made a lot of money at that time. And he was the heavyweight champion of the world. There was a war that America wanted to fight. And in the history of America, they never fought a single war that was a legitimate war. With the exception of the one that they got their freedom from the UK. When they got the independence from the UK, they fought against the UK. That was the only legitimate war that they fought for their own independence. After that, every other war was illegitimate. And one of those illegitimate wars was with these people in Vietnam. They said to Muhammad Ali, we want you to go to Vietnam. You have to come and enlist in the army, put your name down, become a soldier, and we're gonna send you to Vietnam. And what America used to do is, World War I, World War II, any famous person that was in the army, any famous person, they would just sing you and you just sing to the people. You give jokes to the people. If you're a boxer, you just do an exhibition and that's it. Just to raise the morale of the soldiers. You're not going to go fight anybody. They said, this is what we're going to do with you, Muhammad Ali. We're going to send you to the war and you're going to do exhibitions for the soldiers. That man said, I'm not going to the war. I don't believe in it. And as a result of taking that position, he lost his championship belt and he went to prison for, anybody know how many years? Anybody know how many years? 
He went to prison for five and a half years. Which is not a lot of, it's not a little bit of time. Like Yusuf. Yusuf went to the prison for something he didn't do. And then the king, when he realized, when he realized that the lady was the problem, the king said, go and get Yusuf out of the prison. Get him out of the prison. Tell him to come. When they came and said, hey Yusuf, the king wants you to come out of the prison. He said, no, I'm not going to come out until you go back and find out what is the condition of those women that lied on me. What is the condition of those women that lied on me? I want them to confess publicly that I didn't do what they said that I did. Allah Ta'ala mentioned about Yusuf, for Levitha, Fisijini, Bid'a Sinin. He stayed in the prison for three to nine extra years. If all he did was three, that's a lot for something he didn't do. But it could have been four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Hamad Ali went to prison for five and a half years. And he could have just took the offer that they said to him, hey, you're, just gonna, you're never going to go fight. You won't get killed over here. We just want you to dance and do this. He said, I'm not going. That's a characteristic of a man. That's the point. I'm not praising boxing. And I'm not praising Muhammad Ali like a companion or he doesn't have any uh, skeletons. No, every human being got skeletons. Except those prophets and messengers and those companions. What I'm getting you to focus on is something that you can relate to. Here is an individual that you live during his time now that he died. They're going to keep putting him up in the news doing this, doing that. One of the best messages that we can walk away as a Muslim young person is that man, he had his principles. And he wasn't shy to be proud to be the color that he was. He wasn't shy to be of the religion that he was on. He wasn't shy. He used to go to these. He had dyslexia. You people know what dyslexia is? Like when you look at words, they don't look right. They look upside down the letters. Doesn't mean the person is stupid. Muhammad Ali was dyslexic. He could barely read. If you look at a book, if you give him the book upside down, he thinks it's the right way. But it doesn't mean you're stupid. This is your brain. It works like that. So if you're a person who has dyslexia, you can never let that be a reason why you don't want to learn or be a reason why you're insecure about yourself. Don't be like that. Don't be like that. So this individual, this individual, he used to. He couldn't read that well. Couldn't write. He used to go to Oxford University, Cambridge University, and he used to give lectures. Cambridge University, Oxford University, big, elaborate, respected institutions of higher learning in this country, the whole world. He used to go there and he used to give lectures. And if you ever see that on YouTube, you will see how the kids in the audience were riveted by what he was saying because he was just himself. The easiest thing you can do is be yourself. Be yourself. Like it, like it, hate it, hate it. Meaning, I'm a Muslim, I can't change that. This is my color, I can't change This is my sect, I can't change that. The man, he knows and he buys into this thing. The real man. As for the one, as for the one who wants to be a chameleon, he wants to change colors. Whichever way the wind blows, that's how he blows. I'm a Muslim if the wind blows this way, not a Muslim if it blows that way. I'm practicing like I'm in the masjid, it blows this way when I'm in the masjid. When I'm with my friends, it blows that way, I'm going to act like that and so on and so on. So one of the most important characteristics of being a man, you guys, is for the individual to be a person who he has principles and he works by his principles. He lives by his principles. He works by them, he lives by them. And there are no principles that are more important than the principle of your identity, who you are. Your religion being first, and then all of those other issues. What's your ethnic background, where you come from, and all that stuff like that. So don't be a person who's apologetic about that, and don't be a person who is finding that Allah is at fault for making you the way He did. And from that ayat as well, you said that from the believers of men, who took care of their contract with Allah. And the contract that's being talked about here 
is a contract to defend Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his religion. So Allah called those companions men because they took the responsibility to defend their religion, to defend their prophet, to defend his sunnah. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. And this is what we expect from you guys, and this is what we hope from you guys, and this is what we pray to Allah Azza wa Jal to make it possible for you guys as well. Now, you fathers, it's your job, it's your responsibility to have some quality time to talk to these boys and to sit them down, and our wives as well, it's our responsibility, their responsibility, sit down with these girls, educate these girls, especially with the sisters, educating them as far as personal hygiene is concerned, how the Muslim lady should be, how she should look at those ayats, those ahadith that we were talking to about and referring to earlier so that we don't have inside of our homes, right? In our midst, people growing up and the enemies to Allah and His Messenger, the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, because the mother didn't take the time out to clip that weed, that, that poisonous weed that was growing in the mind of the child, the girl, so she grew up and she was one of them uh, crazy women who they talking about women's liberation. But what they mean by that is something that's far into Al-Islam. So may Allah make it easy for you guys. Okay guys, inshallah, we're going to stop here. And we ask Allah to accept it from us and from you. And uh, if your brothers have any questions, you can ask your questions. And if there are any questions about uh, Ramadan, which is going to begin after two more days, hopefully after two more days, you're going to ask any questions about Ramadan very quickly. As for those questions like that came up last week, we want you guys to refrain from asking those kind of questions. They're not cool in public. Fuck them. He's a, an astronaut. He can practice his time going to the moon, in the submarine, under the ocean. Anybody can be a Muslim. Because Islam is going to always have maruna. It's going to be flexible where a person will be able to exist in any circumstance. So if a person finds himself in a circumstance where the environment is not conducive, it's not helping him to be a Muslim, like here, you can say that to a certain degree. It's kind of tough to be a Muslim here because everything in this dunya is mubah. It's you can just do what you want to do. Well, you can still be a Muslim here. Prophet, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, al dunya jannatul kafir wa sijinul mu'min, that the dunya is the paradise of the non-Muslim, and it's the prison of the Muslim. Because the non-Muslim can do whatever he wants to do here, eat what he wants, drink what he wants, say what he wants, whatever, just do it, it's okay. And the Muslim can't do that. He has to say, I can't do this, I can't do this. So it's like he's in prison. He's in prison. So when we're in these environments, you can exist in these environments because Islam has that flexibility to do it. So what are some practical advices? Practical advices, the top of the list is be very, very careful who you choose as your friends and as your mates and the people you want to hang around with because birds of a feather, they flock together. And don't ask about a person if you want to know about him, ask about his friends and who he hang out with. You get a good idea of who he is. Because birds of a feather flock together. You're not going to find a really religious, religious practicing person hanging out with people who are irreligious and they're criminals. Not going to happen. Because they won't allow him to remain with them, nor will he want to be with them. But birds of a feather flock together. So be very, very careful about who you hang out with, who you choose as a companion. Number two, number two, from the men that we could have mentioned, what Allah mentioned in the Quran and the Prophet Prophet Muhammad, he mentioned that there are seven people who will be in the shade on the day there will be no shade. Allah will shade them. And one of them, he said, it was a man whose heart was connected to the masjid. So if a person is trying to practice Islam in this tough environment, the masjid has to have some portion of his time and his presence to rejuvenate himself, to recharge his battery. No matter how the masjid looks, no matter how big, how small, carpet, no carpet, no matter how it looks, when you come into the masjid, there's a different aura, a different environment, a different vibe than when you're out there in the dunya. Because now the human being 
He is slowing down to start to be reminded. Why was he created? Why are you here? When you're out there, everything out there is designed to make you forget. So the Prophet, what did he do? He made a he made this dua imperative. You go to the marketplace, he said the most beloved places to Allah, the masjid. The most hated person place to Allah, the marketplace. Because the marketplace makes you forget about why you were created. You go there and, and you just forget about everything. When you come to the masjid, you're reminded about all of those issues. So give the masjid a portion of your time. And thirdly, and lastly, and many things can be said in the way of giving practical advice about how to practice Islam in this tough, tough environment is that an individual who makes a lot of dua to Allah like the Prophet used to, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked Allah for protection. Protection and not to leave himself responsible for himself the amount of time it takes to bat an eye. Don't make me responsible for myself, ever. Because if I'm responsible for myself, mankind has been created weak. He doesn't have knowledge, and he has his desires, he's weak. So he wants to follow his hell up. He wants to follow his desires. So the Prophet taught us, make dua to Allah to never leave you to your own vices, to follow your own whims and desires. But instead, that Allah takes responsibility and He takes hold of your nasiya, as He said in the hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah is basically um, the one who He is relying on, and Allah knows best. Anakumullah, Any more questions, Ikhwani? Okay, khayr, inshallah. What time is the Adan for Mother, for Asad here? After five, right? Yeah, it's at six. Six.